Too bad that's just for you, right? Maybe the whole church should come to that. Because I think our nation needs a revival. But that is our student ministry is going to be looking at being bold witnesses for Jesus Christ starting tonight at 7 o'clock. And they need for prayers. And uh, hopefully they can light a fire under some of us older people about sharing the good news of Jesus with others. Now, um, I was told that the kids were in uh, Wednesday night at Wave of Wives and had books. Those books are over there on the table on the way out. If they want to have those to take notes during Sunday school, they certainly can. Um, so parents can pick those up. Also, at this time, we're going to be excusing our children up to kindergarten age to Children's Church downstairs if they want uh, to attend. At this time, we're going to read God's Word from John chapter 13, beginning at verse 31 and going to 14, verse 4. Let's stand as we give honor to the And when he had gone out, Jesus said, now, the son of, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while, I am with you. You will seek me, just as I said to the Jews. So now, I also say to you that where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this the world, or all people, will know that you are my disciples, if you have loved one another. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can't, why can, can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, You will lay down your life for me. For, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's, in my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take to myself that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. Thank you. you Maybe see you. One of the cool things over the years, being pastor in Yankton, is being able to connect with some of our late campers. And it's cool to have some of you guys back today um, for the summer season and and so hopefully Discovery Church, you'll be able to get acquainted with some of our, our late residents who have places there and come to visit us on Sundays. And we're always grateful when you come to see us uh, in the Lord's work. Now, um, you know, life has its very pleasant, wonderful moments. Um, celebrating 30 years and an anniversary um, is one of those great experiences of life. Um, because one of the things I don't think people really can calculate in life is what it's like to be the, the, the wife of a pastor, okay? Um, no small task. Um, a, lot of, a lot of things uh, come your way. A lot of sometimes lonely nights with your children while, you're, while your husband's gone. A, a lot of patience and understanding with time schedules, commitments, ministry frustrations, and things that go on in your life both expected and sometimes unexpected. And that's why I really cherish my wife today and 30 years of being married to her because she is a precious gift of God. And, uh, and we, uh, we are so grateful to, our, to God for our kids too. And uh, see how God's working in their lives as well. And to see them answer his call on different phases of their life, it's always exciting to see. Well, we all know we also know that there are some times when we get bad news. When when we get the phone call in the middle of the night, like I did uh, back in December, 
remember it was a Sunday morning. He said, your mom had a heart attack. It's like, wow. That was unexpected. And then to go and to see what happened, to see what transpired in the week, and we've all gotten calls, gotten it, uh, notifications that a loved one is ill, or there's, there's a change or a dramatic situation, an accident that's taken place. We've all been the recipients of bad news, difficulties, news that troubles us, news that, that creates anxiety, worries, concerns, things that change life in an instant where we say, what are we going to do next? How are we going to respond to this? How are we going to get through this? How are we going to cope with this? How in the world are we going to are we going to get stuck in this situation? Are we going to be able to move on from this situation? We know trouble that comes and with the bad news infuses difficult things for our hearts to deal with. And as we look at John chapter 13 verse 33, we notice Jesus delivered what you might call some earth shaking and unsettling news to his disciples when he said, little children, get in a little while I'm with you, which interpreted means, I'm not going to be with you very long. Only for a little while. You'll seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, and now say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. Now think about it. Where I'm going, you cannot come. For three years, all of these 12 guys walked with Jesus, right? They were with them most of every moment of the day, except when they were sleeping, but they were in the same locale. And so they were used to the routine. They were used to what was going on as they gave up their lives to follow Jesus. And now he says, I'm going somewhere where you can't come. I don't know, kind of like... When you were a little kid, and I was in a large family, right? And there were a bunch of older kids, and I was the youngest. And hearing your parents say, the older ones get to go there, but where they're going, you can't come, right? There was a bit of frustration. There's a bit of, of discouragement. There's a bit of something like, well, why not? You know? And so here are the disciples of Jesus. They're... they're, they're Jesus has announced to them a clear separation is going to take place. He was going away, but where he's going, they can't come. The three-year journey that they had enjoyed, that they learned about, that they had seen some amazing things happen for them, is now coming, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to end. And you have to see how confused they are. Because if you look back in John chapter 13 and 12, you know, it's to kind of all get started with the triumphal entry, right? Jesus mounts the coal. He rides into the city of Jerusalem. All the palm branches are waving. Everybody shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It is a wonderful festivity. And the disciples are going, yeah, yeah, we're with Jesus. And all the crowds are just loving him. This is getting better for us by the moment, right? They're thinking Jesus is going to, with all his power, his authority, he is going to wipe out the Romans, and we're going to be, yes, we're going to be right uh, in the midst of this because we are his best guys, right? We're his disciples. This is going to be great, right? They're just thinking this triumphal entry is just the start of something really good, and then all of a sudden, things change when Jesus starts washing their feet. Wait a second. A triumphant king doesn't wash people's feet. And Peter objected, Lord, you can't do that. Guys like you in your position, your power, they don't do stuff like They don't get down and wash stinky, dirty feet. And then from there, he predicts his suffering and his death. And then he goes on to inform them that one of them would betray him. And they're all going looking around. Is it I? Is it I? Is it I? Didn't even know. They were all kind of freaked out. And things are starting to kind of spiral out of control with life. Like, what's going on? Here we have this triumphal entry. Now he's talking about dying. He's washed our feet. And, you know, he's, he's, he's saying one of us is going to betray him. And now, and now he says, where I'm going, you can't go. And it's obvious that this information didn't set up the 
person on their radar screen of what they anticipated, what they were looking forward, like a lot of things that happen in life that really weren't on our radar screen that somehow happened and catch us off guard and leave us going, oh, what do I do now? What's the next step? How do I handle it? What am I supposed to do and respond to this heavy load that's been laid on my life? It was all very confusing and troubling to the disciples. It wasn't making sense. So we shouldn't be surprised that Jesus' first words in John chapter 14 are, let not your heart be troubled. Let not your hearts be troubled. Now, Jesus could sense and see it on their faces. These guys were not smiling when he said, um, where I'm going, you cannot go. He could sense the weight of his words and the trouble in their spirits. He could see it on their faces. And Jesus doesn't want to leave his disciples in a condition of being in trouble. Troubled in their spirits. It's not a good thing, I think we all can suggest and agree with, it's not a good thing to live your life with a troubled heart. Right? To be weighed down with cares, anxieties, concerns, Burdens that we're carrying from life experience. It's not a good thing to live in a constant state of troubledness. And to that, Jesus says, set your hearts at Jesus says, I'm going to give you some perspective now, disciples. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, allow you to see some things and I'm going to teach you some things that are going to help you deal with this announcement. So, so here's what I'm saying. If you're here today and you're burdened in life, you're carrying some troubles, I would ask you to do one thing. If you're dealing with some confusion and trouble, read this week, John 14 through 16. This is, the, this is the information that Jesus gave to his disciples at one of their lowest moments in the journey. To lift them up, to encourage them, to infuse some hope to them, to keep them focused in the game and continuing to function even though some very difficult things were yet to come for them to experience in their life. I call this spiritual therapy, if you would like to call it that. And it begins with, set your minds at ease, in John chapter 14. And if you go to the end of John 16, it says, take heart. I have overcome the world. And sandwiched in between is words of encouragement and also equipping, helping disciples to prepare for the time that they will live their life where Jesus is away. In that, what we will call a temporary absence while Jesus is away. Because in this chapter we find, these three chapters, powerful encouragement for disciples. And you notice I say it's temporary. Because Jesus makes it very clear that his going away is not forever. This is not a permanent state, disciples. It's just for a time. And while he's away, Jesus has an important work to accomplish that's going to benefit all of his followers. And Jesus lets us in on it. Jesus lets us in on it. Hey, so Jesus, you're going away. We can't go anywhere. What are you going to be doing while you're away? Well, I'm going to tell you here. I'm going to let you know. My going away, you're going to benefit from this because what I'm going to be doing while I'm away. And Jesus supplies in these verses the truth to anchor our soul. To be a resource for us. To live our lives as an influential and inspirational person in life. Because, you know, there's a lot of people living their lives without a lot of hope. 
When a disaster strikes, they're not sure what to do. When they get the bad phone call with the accident, with the injury, with the illness, with this, they're not really sure how to cope. They're not really sure what to do. Because they really don't have their lives anchored in any way, in any kind of spiritual foundation for life. They have their life anchored in the American economy, the American worldly system, that they've just sort of functioned through life, and they really don't have any substantive foundational truths to really anchor their soul, that give them perspective and help and hope uh, as we all have to work through difficult situations in their life. So quickly this morning, I want to go through five things that we learn from this text about truth for truth times. When we are called to, to overcome or to respond to bad times or troubled times in our life. First of all, troubled times urge followers to greater faith and trust in Jesus. Troubled times just call every one of us, they urge us, they're calling us to, to exercise greater faith and trust in Jesus. You see, the one quality we will need to display and that will need to be seen in our lives in the face of troubled times is our faith. That is the one quality that we will be tested, will be developed, will be strengthened if we allow it to in the face of troubled times. And that's what Jesus is asking of his disciples. Peter notice what he says. You believe in God, now believe also in me. First statement. Hey, set your hearts at ease. You believe in God? Trust me. Believe also in me. And then here's what I'm going to tell you to, to, to why you can trust me. Okay? So Jesus is asking us to trust Him. He's asking us to put our faith in Him. And it's kind of interesting. Years later, Peter, remember Peter? Never short on words, never short on a response, right, to what, what was going on. Years later, when he sits down and the Holy Spirit encourages him, as he is talking to Christians who are suffering persecution for their identification with Jesus Christ, Peter makes this statement. Your faith is more valuable than gold, which is perishable. Even though it is tested by fire, the fire of trials, and the, the fire of troubled times may be found to result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter saw the value of what Jesus said when he said, believe in me. And then you look at the Apostle John, who wrote these words in John 14, as the Holy Spirit inspired those two, you go to 1 John chapter 5. John is telling Christians who are facing trials and tribulations and testings in their life, going through hard times and troubled times, in 1 John chapter 5, 4, what does he say? Whoever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith, our faith. So, these apostles are saying, the one element that is going to help you through every trial is your ability to put your trust, your faith, in the words of Jesus. Your faith, your faith, in the words of Jesus. And we can look at the history of Christianity over 2,000 years. And we can say, who has always pro prospered and thrived in the middle of troubles times in history? What people have, have constantly proven to be unfazed by difficult times, whose minds were at ease when everything else around them was going crazy and in conflict? It was the disciples of Jesus who stood strong in their faith in God and His Word, and they responded with that, the confidence that comes from a living faith. So Jesus says to his followers, the key to survival in troubled times is a strong faith. And John learned that from his own experiences. He learned from his own experience following that command of trust in me, believe in me, believe in what I'm going to tell you, believe in these words that will filter in in our text into three chapters, believe in me, trust these words, and you're going to be all right. So it, it is very essential 
that when we face troubled times, we need a thriving faith. A faith that's grounded in the Word of God, a faith that has grown and matured through the trials and challenges of life, a faith that is confidence, confident that in all things God can, is faithful and He can be trusted. We need a faith that reaches from our head to our toes, a faith that knows what's true, it believes what's true, and then it's willing to act on what's true. Staying faithful and confident that God is in control of everything, working out His plans and purposes for the, for the, according to the counsel of His will. It is a faith that is confident that God is not surprised by our minds. God is aware of them, and He's actively working in the midst of them. And I ask you this morning, how strong is your faith today? And I have to say, most of us in America really don't have our faith tested a whole lot. Do I, I think this little um, experience that begins tonight about witnessing is going to test some people's faith, right? That's the goal. But how many of us really live by faith? Experience, go through experience of life where we really need a supreme measure of faith. Everything's been provided for us. Everything we have. And when you get accustomed to everything being there all the time, you begin to develop a sense of self-reliance that isn't always good. Because Jesus really encourages His disciples to develop a reliance on Him, a faith in Him and the, His Word and the things that He's going to teach, not a reliance in themselves. So I ask you, how strong is your faith today? Is your faith ready to face the phone call that might come today, tomorrow, or the next day? Is your faith ready to face something that isn't on your radar screen right now today that could be very significantly earth-shaking to your life? Is your faith ready to say, I'm trusted in Jesus and His Word. I'm going to go to the promises that He says to me and act on them. Secondly, we see in this passage that the fuel for our faith in troubled times is the future that God promises to those who persevere in faith. It's the confidence, um, really, in, of our faith is in the promises that are given. And you notice in this text, Jesus gives some promises. Jesus tells his disciples some very incredible things. And here's the promise. Disciples, God has a wonderful house he wants to share with you, his children. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, if it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? See, after calling his disciples to faith, in response to the troubled times that they are facing, Jesus gives them truth to fuel their faith. He gives them a promise. He gives them some certainty. He gives them some things to hold on to. Solid promises to keep the disciples hanging in there. Strong, resilient. What was the promise? To give them a strong faith and confidence in Him. He says, here's what. I want to give this promise to you. I'm going to give you a future of taking up residence in heaven with God. That's a, pretty, that's a pretty good promise, if you didn't think, if you didn't know it. Because most people living at this time, they lived and they died. Just like everybody, they lived and they died. They really didn't have any solid confidence, just like that guy that said, are you sure you're going to heaven? Um, I hope so. I've heard that from a lot of people. Well, I, I hope so, but I'm not, I'm not really sure. Can anybody be really sure? Jesus wanted his disciples to be sure, right? So he gives them this promise. Your eternal home, he went awaits you. And that's what Jesus is seeking to convey in verse 2. My Father's house has many dwelling places. In other words, it's a cooperative 
relationship that exists between Jesus and the Father. Together, two distinct personalities of the God of this miraculous, mysterious trinity, Father and Son working together. And Jesus' first statement tells us that the future home God has for us is big enough for every one of us. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Nobody's going to be left out, right? It's big enough. And it's for His children. Our eternal home, get this, is currently being prepared for inhabitation by Jesus in the same way that a groom prepared his home for the love of his wife, his bride. And most of us don't get this, right? Because we grew up in a culture where brides decide how the wedding's going to go, right? It's a woman's task, right? So they plan the wedding, right? And there's weddings all the time going on right now this time of year, and many brides go out and plan their wedding. But in the Jewish culture, brides do not plan their weddings. Grooms plan the wedding. And it all started when the dads of the bride and the groom got together, and they arranged their children's marriage. Right? Kids are going to get married. Right? We agree on this. Bring it together. The kids agree on it. They're betrothed. They make a covenant together. We're going to be married. And then what happens? They separate. The bride goes home to her family, and the groom goes, and he goes away to prepare a life and a home for his blessed bride, who he someday will come and claim, and they'll share a glorious wedding day. Guess what's happening now? The bride of Christ is being built on earth, and the groom is away preparing the home for their inhabitation when this life is over. That's what Jesus is doing now. That's why he needs to be away, right? And Jesus says, if this weren't the case, if this wasn't true, he says, if this in fact were not certain, Jesus said, I wouldn't have told you. In other words, Jesus is saying, I'm not in the business of giving you false hope. I'm not in the business of throwing out promises to you that I cannot keep. In other words, Jesus isn't just telling them stuff for the moment to sort of settle their hearts that will just pacify them for the moment. Because we know people will do that to us, won't they? They'll tell us what we want to hear for the moment to pacify us. But if we were really to count on the words that they were giving to us, we, were, we wouldn't be sure. Later in time, we find out if it was really true. And most of us know how our faith in people can diminish over time when they promise to do things and never come through with them. You ever, you ever run into people like that? I know there's people like, they'll say, hey, uh, let's do this. Or, we're going to do this. There's a guy that keeps telling me, hey, we're going to play a game of golf. And I have to keep saying to him, no, we're not. Because he keeps saying it. He's been saying that for two years now. Yeah, 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 gotta, be, gotta get, you, get you the key. We gotta, we gotta have a key to golf. I, know. I'm, I just want to say, no, we're not. <laughs> just like those people that say, I'll call you later. Mm, no, you're not. Now, why do we say that? Because they've been saying that all the time. And how many people say stuff just to say stuff? They don't mean it, and we know it. Why? Because time after time after time after time, the words never come true. That's why I said in that sermon, you know, parents and children, how to exasperate your children, don't exasperate your children by giving them false hope, false promises. Oh, yeah, I'll do that, and then it's time to do it, and you go, I'm sorry, I can't do it right now. You know what happens? Then they start to think, that guy's words, no good. He just says it to pacify me for the moment, to get me off his case from nagging him about, hey, good, can we go, can we go, can we go? Yeah, sure, we'll do it. And then it never happens. Jesus doesn't give those kinds of words to disciples. He doesn't see the disciples trouble, 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 trouble. Hey, what's going on, Jesus? Hey, guys, it's going to be okay. Uh, we got it all covered. You know, I'm, I'm going to, when I go away, I'm going up to heaven and build you a house. And, and when I come, he's not saying that without me. No one would ever say that, right? They'd be, they'd be either crazy to say that, or they'd never say that unless they could, right, come through with the goods. Who would ever say, I'm going to heaven to prepare for you a place, right? Nobody would say that. 
And so, the Lord gives us His Word. And faith says we need to trust that. I'm going to prepare for this. Three, it's not to our advantage to have Jesus physically present with us. How many times have you said, man, I want to see Jesus, right? Well, you're going to see him. Every day, everybody will see him someday. But in this portion of God's plan, right? It is so important for Jesus not to be with us. He said, my absence is really a benefit for you. And you're going to find out what kind of benefit it really is. While I'm away, I'm going to be preparing for you an eternal home that we can enjoy forever. So Jesus' temporary absence for his disciple is for their eternal benefit and blessing. And he will mention that again when he announces the coming of the Holy Spirit. Hey, it's, it's okay, guy. When I go, guess what? My presence is going to be with every one of you through the Holy Spirit who dwells in every one of you. I can only be with you spatially one at a time, and I can't be with you. Five billion people at one time, but the Holy Spirit can. <coughs> Is I need to go away to a place where you cannot come. So keep doing the work that I've asked you to do in my absence. And you know what? Our faith and our patience will be rewarded. I don't know about some of you, maybe you had an opportunity to build a house in your life, a new house, you know? And you're in the old house, and you, the old house, and you see the new house coming, and you all know that at the time of building a new house, there are those wonderful things called delays, right? Delays, right? Delays. You're already in, oh, this happened, it's going to be another two weeks, or it's going to be another this, you know. <sighs> delay, delay, delay. But the anticipation, the hopeful anticipation, as you see, as you know, the structure is being allows you to work through the delay because of the anticipation of what's coming. And that's what Jesus is saying by telling his disciples in advance what he's doing. Guys, you gotta hang in here. Because when your life on this earth is done, I have something wonderful. I'm prepared for this. Four things. This is the key thing. Jesus wants us to be in heaven. Jesus wants us to be in heaven. That's his ultimate goal for every one of us. He wants every one of us to be in heaven because heaven is so much better than life on this. Okay? Got that? Heaven is so much better than life on this earth that where I am, there you may be. Christ died for our sins, the, the just for the unjust, in order that he might what? Bring us to God. Jesus died so that he could bring us to God, so that he could prepare the way, so that we would be acceptable in the presence of God, because we're sinners, we're unholy, we're unrighteous. We're like those girls who say, yeah, um, yeah, I think I've lied. Uh, maybe not, or I stole something. Yeah, it wasn't from a store, but it might have been from my brothers or sisters or someone else. Those kind of people aren't acceptable in the presence of the Holy God, but Jesus went to the cross to take the wrath of God on Himself with His perfect righteousness to give that to us so that we could be acceptable in the presence of God and that we could have that wonderful assurance that through our faith in Jesus Christ, we have uh, the hope of something so much better uh, than this life. And in case you didn't know it. And, and you know, I'm, I'm just going to say this, I'm not convinced every Christian believes this. And, and I think it shows sometimes. There is a better place than where we are right now. Now, I know Yank it's pretty good. I've been here 11 years, almost 11 years. I know it's a pretty good place. But there, there is a better place than Yank, okay? Right? And it's not on some tropical island 
Although it would be nice in the middle of January to jump off a ladder, right? This is the place where God dwells, where God is enthroned in heaven. And there is no better place in the world. The question is, do you believe? And our belief in that will show in how we live. Because so much of what this world and Satan's system as the prince of the power of the air is to keep us so enamored and entrenched and, and sort of wrapped up in this world that somehow heaven just doesn't seem all that glorious to us. Folks, it's going to be glorious because Jesus says he's preparing a place for us. So that where he is, we can be with him. The fifth thing we see, the fact that he's in heaven preparing for us a place means he's coming again. He's coming again. He will return and escort us to our eternal home. His departure doesn't mean they, will, they won't see each other again. Rather, it only assures that he will come again. There's a specific date, day, time, on heaven's timetable, known only to God the Father, but I believe he is inching much more closer than many people really believe that Jesus' return isn't that far away. You can see it in the signs that are taking place in the Mideast and all over the globe that Christ is coming, is getting so much closer than we ever anticipated. And the question is, are you ready for Jesus to return? So many of the parables that Jesus taught were about disciples being ready for Jesus to return. The master goes away for a time, and he leaves his servants in charge, and then he returns to take an account of what they did while he was away. How did they use the investments that Jesus endowed in their lives through his grace in the gospel? How did they use that? Are we ready for Christ's return? Are you ready to see Jesus? To me, that sounds like something worth waiting for. That where I am, there you may be. I don't know. I just think people, I just tell them to <coughs> The greatest person that ever lived. I, I just think that is the place where I want to be. And I'm so grateful that I had two people in my life that shared that with me. That the greatest place to be is with Jesus. That was a long time. They lived their lives showing me that getting so tied to this world just has a lot of complications and frustration. And when you can live beyond this world, when you can focus yourself on what's coming, a lot of things just don't matter anymore what takes place on this earth. A lot of things aren't just worth quibbling over anymore. A lot of the things that we have arguments and, the, and divide and split over in life just aren't worth it. The, the things that we make mountains just become nothing when we focus on what's coming, not on what's here. And it's kind of interesting that we find uh, in the, the Bible how uh, there's such an encouragement for us to keep our minds fixed on things above where Christ is seated. Why does he do that? Why does, why, does, why, does, why does Paul say that? Set your mind on things above. Because when heaven and eternity so become our desire and our focus, a lot of the things that we make so big and so important and just ultimately complicate and frustrate and destroy our lives just don't matter because of where we're going, where we're headed, what really matters. So I ask you today, do you believe?
believe the words of Jesus. And do you believe that he's preparing a place for you? Now, one of the verses on that little video that Aaron showed us this morning says, Narrow is the road and the door and the way that leads to life everlasting, and very few enter. You know why Jesus said that? Because so many people in life believe that they can enter heaven through their own merits, their own works, their own good deeds. And not through Jesus Christ and Him alone. And guess what we're going to learn next week? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except for me. Have you come to Jesus? By faith. Have you trusted Him? Do you believe that He gave His life? on that cross for you. And he died for you. Do you believe he's in heaven right now? I just like us all to bow our hands for a moment. This is the most important time of your life. Jesus brings the most encouraging message to every person who's troubled in life. And he says, but don't set your mind There's going to be some disappointments in this life because it's a world that is dominated and controlled under the power of an enemy, right? This world is going to be filled with trouble. But the last words of the text are, Take heart, I'm overcome. Well, Jesus is overcoming, and he's promised us so much better. But it requires one thing. You believe in God? There's a lot of people who believe in God. You need to believe in Jesus. How do you accept? Have you trusted him? Are you ready for him to return? Because it could be today. It could be today. I remember my dad used to have a statement on a piece of paper above his desk that said, it may be anger. We need that on our armbands, our wristbands. Not live strong, that's a pretty good thing. Live strong for Jesus, but it may be today. Are you ready? Are you prepared? Are you watching? Are you waiting for Jesus? Just like to play a little song at this point, and just ask for you to just try your heart before the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you prepared? Are you ready? Do you know that Jesus is preparing a place? Do you know that He's coming again? If, you, if you're not sure and you want assurance today, we'd like me to pray with you and talk to you about that while the song is played.